what I'd like to sort of start with or to think about, I think, is uh, what uh, often uh, strikes me as a tendency to try to make sense of the current moment, and particularly the current moment in Palestine, uh, through a language of uh, irrationality, is that we come back time and time again to the fact that what's taking place is irrational. Uh, how is it possible that Western governments continue to support a genocide? How is it possible that the Democratic Party is prepared to uh, torpedo its last possible chances to maybe win an election uh, in order to kind of continue to arm, uh, facilitate, and uh, advance um, the, the current genocide that is playing itself out in, um, uh, in Gaza. Uh, and it seems to me that the language of irrationality is dangerous. I think it hides to us what is playing in front of us. Uh, and it hides the fact that what we are seeing is, on the one hand, Zionism speaking, uh, the logic of not only pushing Palestinians uh, in as little land uh, as possible, uh, and in fact moving towards a kind of a, a, a logic of, uh, or at least a desire of full elimination on the one hand, but also that what we are seeing is imperialism speaking, and that I don't think actually uh, what is being unleashed on the Palestinians is irrational. I think what is being unleashed on the Palestinians tells us something about uh, the system uh, that we live in, and I, I, I want to kind of try to think about that and to, and to tease it out. And I, I want to do that in three ways. The first one is to say that I think it tells us something about the logic of settler colonialism. Um, not only in terms of the fact that Zionism and the Israeli state are a settler colonial project, uh, the building of a colony that aims at rebuilding or at, at, at regenerating a new uh, colonial society in the land that is being colonized, but also the role that settler colonialism plays in the maintaining, the, maintaining, the creating and the reproducing uh, of uh, the world economy. Uh, if you think about how and where settler colonies have been generated, they've often been placed at strategic places in the world economy in order to serve as continuous police forces um, uh, in maintaining trade routes, uh, extractive processes, etc. Um, we'll hear more about some historic uh, uh, parallels, but of course that's true for South Africa. The importance of the Cape uh, was a central nodal point in the world economy, uh, the trade routes towards Asia, uh, and then uh, the uh, maintaining of the extractive possibilities of natural resources uh, from the mines of Southern Africa that fed continuously uh, the, the local economy. And that what is necessary to maintain that peace is an extraordinary amount of violence meted out against indigenous populations every time they fight back. And so that the history uh, Marx famously talks about the history of capitalism being written in letters of blood and fire into the annals of humanity. Uh, and that's, of course, uh, one that we are seeing playing out uh, in, in front of us for, for the moment. And so that the logic of settler colonialism is not only one that um, uh, puts settlers uh, in a direct confrontation uh, uh, with indigenous populations, of course, uh, it is that also, but it is also one that puts imperialism in direct confrontation with those populations. This is true uh, for Zionism from its very emergence. Uh, why is it that Western government supported Zionism immediately? There's a, a beautiful, beautiful is the wrong uh, adjective, uh, very striking uh, quote by the first British colonial uh, official in Palestine in the 1920s, Sir Ronald Storrs, who explains British support for Zionism by saying, Zionism will be for us, so for the British Empire, a loyal little Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism. So he's also making the connection with other settler colonial projects, but the central question is for the British Empire, the creation of uh, a, a military base in a region that is of key importance to the world economy, and it remains so. It's at the crossing of uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It's next to the Suez Canal, which remains the most important uh, thoroughfare of uh, maritime trade in the world, and it's at the heart of a key region for the world economy, given the concentration of oil in that region, which is the, center, the, the central uh, blood flow that makes uh, a global economy possible at the speed and scale uh, that, that we are used to. It is not only the British uh, in uh, the 1920s who thought about Zionism this way. If we think about the 1970s, uh, Alexander Haig, who was the US Secretary of State at the time, 
described Israel in these words. He says, Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier in the world that cannot be sunk, does not carry even one American soldier, and is located in a cr critical region for American national security. And that unsinkable airplane carrier uh, is the reason why our government, the United States, other Western governments continue to pour extraordinary amounts of, thanks, uh, of armament uh, into Israel. Um, how does that make sense uh, today? For a very long time, that role was primarily a military one. Uh, and I don't have the time to, to talk about it, but we can think of 56, 67, 73 as kind of key moments where that power was express, expressed militarily. What I want to focus on in, in the last two minutes that I have is that from the late 1970s with the destruction of Arab nationalism, the key role of Israel in that imperial project has been to serve as a, a conduit for normalization with the West in general and the United States in particular. The peace deals with Egypt and Jordan, the economic deals that came with it, uh, more recently the so-called Abraham Accords, have all been part of an ongoing project located primarily in Washington of bringing together key allies of Western imperialism in the region through networks of military, economic, uh, and diplomatic connections uh, in order for them to be able to do the work without the United States having to be directly uh, involved. That strategy has accelerated majorly under the Obama years in which the United States uh, operated its so-called pivot to Asia, which was the idea that it was no longer as interested in the Middle East as before and that it needed to deal with China and the Pacific and that that's where its military and economic focus needed to be. And that in that process, greater normalization was necessary between the different allies of the United States, primarily the UAE, uh, the uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel in order for them to play uh, the role of police agents in that region. Uh, that's how uh, the kind of acceleration that happens in the moment of the Abraham Accords uh, uh, can be understood, is that attempt by the empire to pull itself out as much as possible and let the kind of different airplane carriers that it has in the region to play the role. That process of decades of facilitating um, the normalization and the integration of Israel with the other allies of the United States entered a fundamental moment of crisis in the first hours of the 7th of October. And I think we can't understand everything that happens after that without that crucial moment. Is that the moment that the Palestinians break out of the prison that is the Gaza Strip, immediately all the contradictions that the central focus of American imperialism in the region has been to flatten as much as possible, have broken out into the fore. The Palestinian question has become central again. The masses of the region have re-entered moments of struggle that we haven't seen for a decade, and we'll hear more about it in a second. And the ruling classes of the region are, for the first time in at least a decade, scared again of advancing on that path. And the only way back, not only for the American ruling class, but of uh, for the American and, and Western ruling classes as well, is to punish and to punish and to punish again and to send the message that any form of resistance to that plan will be drawn in blood in absolute horror uh, in the way that we've seen for the last seven months. And so it's important to me not to kind of uh, push that away in the language of irrationality, but to say this is exactly the rationality of the system and without this kind of violence, it can't hold. And that, I think, leads us to much more kind of uh, radical and important political consequences. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, comrades, for uh, giving me the platform uh, to speak tonight. And um, I will uh, pick up from what my comrade has been uh, saying earlier about the region's ruling class, uh, classes being scared. And here is the question, why are the Arab rulers scared of what's happening now in Palestine? Why is the Egyptian regime closing down the Rafah crossing? Why is the Jordanian king flying back and forth and meeting with Israelis in order to crush uh, uh, pro-Palestine dissent in his streets and trying to resolve the war as soon as possible. 
Now, many uh, people who are not familiar with the struggle in the Middle East, they usually assume that on the one hand, there are the Arab states and they support the Palestinians because they are our fellow brothers and sisters. And on the other hand, there is Israel supported by the West. But actually, the, the picture is much more complicated than that. The Palestinian cause has always been the biggest and the strongest radicalizing and politicizing factor for the Arab youth generations after generations. Any important turning point in the history of local dissent in Arab countries would be directly or indirectly related to Palestine. The Palestinians, when they resist the Israelis, they act as an inspirational model for the rest of the Arab masses who are languishing under uh, authoritarian and military dictatorships that at the end of the day, they are allied with the US and allied with Israel, either explicitly or implicitly. And hence, we can understand why the Arab regimes, they hate the Palestinians. I can tell you that the Arab regimes, they hate the Palestinians even more than Israel hates them. It's because every single uprising in the region usually can trace lineage to what's happening in Palestine. I want to give you like a, a, like a quick example of a protest that, um, that I took part in in my university when I was an undergraduate student in 1999, like long time ago, before the outbreak of the second Palestinian Intifada. At the time, Israel was bombing southern Lebanon and we uh, called for a protest on my university campus so the students gathered and, you know, as always, the protest started with chants in support of the Palestinians, in support of the Lebanese and against Israel and against the U.S. Few minutes later, the shift with, of the protest and the chants started to slightly change the focus into why isn't our government doing enough to help the Palestinians? Few minutes later, the focus started to change into why is our government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians, they open a, a, an embassy, they allow the Israelis to have an embassy in the heart of Cairo. And then a few minutes later, the focus of the chants and the protests started to slightly shift into, oh, and the same government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians, that's opening up an embassy for Israel, is the same government that exports cement to Israel, which is being used to build those illegal settlements. And then as soon as the police troops showed up, people started also the focus of the chance to change into anti-police chance. And people would start asking, why is our government that doesn't want to help the Palestinians that's opening up a, an embassy for Israel in the heart of Cairo, that's exporting cement to Israel, instead of sending troops to help the Palestinians and the Lebanese, they are sending police troops to squash our peaceful protest. And then by the end of that protest, comrades, we were discussing the housing crisis in Egypt, we were discussing the austerity economic policies, we were discussing the Bilharsia disease that's eating up the peasants, in the south of Egypt, we were discussing the burning of the sugarcane fields during the, the government's counterinsurgency campaign. As you can see, the regional becomes the local right away in any pro-Palestine protest. Comes the year 2000, and that's when the second Palestinian Intifada uh, uh, broke out. And suddenly in Egypt, we had the biggest wave of protest that, that the country had seen since the 1977 so-called bread uprising, which was an uprising that lasted for two days against the US-backed uh, dictator Anwar Sadat when he uh, implemented neoliberal policies. In case you didn't know, Sadat's Egypt and Pinochet's Chile, they were among the pioneers of neoliberalism in the global south. Now, in the year 2000, as soon as the Palestinians started their uprising, Suddenly, you had 
tens of thousands of Egyptians protesting, although for two decades before that, the social movement had ended, more or less, in Egypt. Because simply, people on the TV screens, they were watching live on Al Jazeera, Palestinian kids taking on Israeli tanks. And the obvious conclusion that they have reached is drawing parallels. If those kids can take on Israeli tanks, we can take on Mubarak's police. That's the kind of conclusion that they have drawn. So it's not a coincidence that you started to get a rising social curve of struggles after the outbreak of the second Palestinian Intifada in the year 2000 that turned into an anti-war movement when Iraq got invaded. And then we occupied Tahrir Square for two days in running battles with the so-called Central Security Forces in what became a dress rehearsal for the uprising a decade later in Tahrir Square. And all of these regional mobilizations created for us a room to revive street politics that was dead in Egypt. And it's not a coincidence that, for example, the anti-Mubarak movement, Kifaya, which is Arabic for enough, it started in the year 2004, after three years of mobilizing over Palestine and Iraq. And this took us into a trajectory that led eventually to the 2011 uprising. During the uprising, most of the liberal commentators in the West um, tried to depict the events as purely domestic, of uh, bilingual middle-class Egyptian youth who are sporting BlackBerry and they are using Facebook and Twitter in order to rebel against uh, a, a military aging dictator, but, and that this has got nothing to do with foreign policy, but that's a lie. Because in Tahrir Square, there were chants against Israel, there were chants against the US. The Israeli embassy was stormed twice in 2011 and people were calling for severing ties with the Israeli state. Hence, it's not also a, co a coincidence that when the coup in Egypt started in 2013 and it crushed the revolution, the kind of regime that evolved out of this coup, this counter-revolutionary regime became Israel's best friend. And it's the same regime that's trying to kill off the Palestinians today with the help of Netanyahu. Hence, comrades, when we say that the road to Jerusalem passes through Cairo and the Arab capitals, this is not an abstract slogan. We've seen glimpses of it, and we hope that, that this will happen in the near future because we have suffered a huge defeat over the past decade. But there are things on the ground that give us hope that our fortunes are changing. Again, thanks to Palestine. So uh, first and foremost, also from me, um, grateful thank you for having me today um, and having me talk about the cracks uh, of the Zionist project also on site, on the ground in uh, Palestine itself. Um, and I think what's important is that the Palestinian resistance, we have to understand that, send a very clear sign. We also heard about it before that the normalization of the Arab regimes without Palestinians having any word, with Palestinians being excluded, doesn't work this way. And that Palestinians will continue to resist. And despite all the horrors of the genocide in Gaza, we are seeing the Palestinian resistance and its international solidarity movement remains and grows. And people around the world Millions of people are inspired by this Palestinian defiance and identify with the Palestinians as oppressed and that's what's being waged against them as the focus of everything wrong with this system. Um, and even within the midst of destruction in Gaza, the uh, wars, uh, war aims of the Israeli army couldn't be fully uh, implemented. They have no idea. The US and Israel are, despite everything, despite all the destruction, the, the genocide, the deliberate killing of civilians, 
and raising off entire neighborhoods have no real solution and perspective for what to do in Gaza for the next months. It's, it's very clear. The US also said in May and was finally a bit more open that militarily the aims the Israeli army uh, set as crushing and ending Hamas will not be um, successful in the end. And also these ideas of the more fascist wing of the Israeli government, of Ben Gvir and so on, to resettle in Gaza. I mean, we have to be clear why in the first place Sharon back then uh, re had the settlers retreat and so on. Um, the, uh, this um, resistance in Gaza is still there and it even um, shows up in uh, places of the north again, in Beit Lahia, in Beit Hanun, in Jabalia, in Khan Yunus and so on, everywhere where the Israeli army is gone and focusing on um, uh, Rafah right now, um, Palestinian resistance and um, uh, recruitment also for the armed resistance is regrowing again and uh, regaining uh, momentum. Um, so all this architecture and the lost grip the US imperialism and other Western uh, governments um, are trying to have on the Middle East um, is declining, is in, in a relative decline, like in the inter-imperialist competition and um, uh, war um, uh, developments we've seen um, uh, yeah, worldwide and also uh, when it comes to uh, sub-Saharan Africa for example where we've, we've seen a lot of military coups um, in Niger and other countries uh, we've seen new developments in the US, uh, China and Russia um, uh, competition there. Um, when it comes um, to the um, tens of thousands killed in Gaza where we rightly and justified um, have a focus um, right now, we tend to forget what's going on in the West Bank as well. Also, hundreds being killed, thousands um, being in the um, Israeli detention centers, uh, being tortured and killed in uh, these torture chambers. Um, still, um, about 700 um, Palestinian children being um, detained each year. And the uh, question of the Palestinian prisoners is a, still a vital and important question. But even in the West Bank, we can see certain cracks in the Zionist project. When um, the, the, uh, there is a certain dead end, if the Israeli government meant, wants to an fully annex officially the West Bank, what is going to happen with all the Palestinians? They are tr still trying to do the ethnic cleansing, trying to build new settlements and so on, but there is also growing resistance in the West Bank. We have seen the lion's den in uh, Nablus. We have seen um, the wasp's nest in, uh, they, they seem to like animal names, in the, <laughs> in the Jenin uh, refugee camps um, and so on. And in Balata, uh, it's growing and there are new resistance groups emerging that are not under control of the subcontractor of um, Israeli occupation in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority. And that's also what we have to name very clearly. When we are talking here about um, uh, the, the two-state solution and um, the implementation of it, with all the settlements and the infra infrastructure that has been built in the West Bank, it has never been more than a fig leaf for ongoing occupation and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, and it will not be implemented, even though when we see the rising um, Palestine solidarity movement and some states even in Europe now um, accepting a Palestinian state, that comes from the pressure uh, from below against it. But still, um, this, this is not a perspective um, for, for the Palestinian liberation at the end of the day. Um, and the state repression we see, especially in Germany, where I come from, when it comes to the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, but we see it also in other European uh, countries, it's exactly connected to that. They want to keep their fig leaf of fake diplomacy and the fake two-state solution ongoing um, that has no perspective at all. At all. And the growing support uh, for Hamas we are seeing in the West Bank is not because they feel a political or ideological affiliation with uh, political Islam as such, um, but 
it's more the question resistance or acceptance of the status quo of um, occupation and um, settlements. That's what we've seen. And since October, it has um, increased a lot as well. Um, while Fatah and um, especially the um, Palestinian Authority, for many, um, are the embodiment of um, uh, collaboration with uh, Zionism and the Israeli occupation. It seems to many that Hamas, even though many also see the corruption, especially in the Gaza Strip, like they saw with the PLO before, um, uh, see, see a certain way of resistance. Um, and the Palestinians with Israeli citizenship also play a role uh, within that, uh, that can't be forgotten, just like the uh, diaspora. Uh, and what we've seen during the, the uprising um, of, uh, against the um, evictions of uh, Sheikh Jarrah in 2021 was a mass general strike, also including this. Um, it was called like a uh, unity in the father. Where, where it was beyond these fractures and all these divisions that have divided the Palestinian population between Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, West Bank, and 48, that it was uh, broken a little bit, and they cost the Israeli economy 40 million in just that one general strike. But still, we have to see and understand that the Palestinian working class doesn't have the same position, I think we will hear more about that, as the South African black working class, being 80% back then of the population, the Palestinians being around 50%, and Zionism working systematically with the exclusion of Palestinians from the main pillars of the Israeli economy. So we have to look at the international and especially regional working class and their struggle being directly connected to the Palestinian struggle because they have the same enemy of imperialism and also the Arab regimes collaborating with Zionism. But all in all, what we are seeing is that internationally and the international solidarity movement has led to a point where Israel is becoming increasingly seen as a pariah state around the world and that it is continuing. And that uh, in Jordan we have seen masses in Egypt, again, we have seen new demonstrations, despite the situation there being horrendous and enormously repressive. And in Morocco, student initiatives starting. And in the West, the student encampments. OK, I'll wrap it up. Um, we see also reason for hope. And we see that Palestinian liberation is directly connected to the liberation of all against the capitalist system driven by profit, oppression, and exploitation. And that's why we see the masses saying, in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. That's why they identify with this struggle for liberation. chairperson of the Dutch anti-apartheid movement for many years. And since the focus of this festival is going to be on the is, on the gruesome war and genocide against the Palestine people, I think it is a good idea. Because there are lessons to be learned from the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. It's actually quite unknown, but still it can't be a surprise that the ties between South apartheid South Africa and Israel were always, for many years, very, very strong. In 1948, for God's sake, my birth year, the state of Israel was welcomed into the world, as was the apartheid system in South Africa. Welcomed by the Western world, not by the Africans, not by the Palestinians, so not by the pe people who lived in these countries. Since that moment, these two states, isolated as they slowly became, were more and more supportive of each other, in, within the background, of course, the massive assistance of the usual suspects, the US, Great Britain, and most West European countries. 
unknown to most people is that the cooperation between these two states slowly took a very dangerous form. I'll give you one example. They collaborated heavily in the development of nuclear weapons with the idea that these weapons could be used in, in, the in their future against their enemies. For South Africa, the African states close to them, and for Israel, the Arab world. When apartheid in South Africa was defeated, when the people of South Africa, black and white, finally could go to the polls in 1994, it was a dark day for Israel. When Nelson Mandela was elected first democratic president, it was a dark day for Israel. And I never forget that when all world leaders came to South Africa for the funeral, fru uh, funeral of Nelson Mandela, Israel just sent a message that they had no time to attend. These days, the South Africans are, very, are still very aware of this devilish collaboration. That's why it's not a great surprise, but still of great importance, that it was South Africa, the South African people, who brought the genocide case to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. It moved me to tears. With lots of things going wrong in South Africa, international solidarity is still very much alive. I visited Cape Town and Johannesburg during last February. I talked to many people, old comrades, young students, unemployed youngsters and factory workers, and I'm convinced that this is not just an, a publicity stunt by the government of South Africa, as it said, no, no. It is really moving to see how the solidarity with this Palestine people is very much alive amongst ordinary South Africans. And they all are familiar with that very important statement of Nelson Mandela in December 1997 on the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, when he said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. This discussion with old comrades made another thing clear to me. There's no doubt that they are more than anyone aware of the trap that the two-state solution is. One state for the Arabs and one state for the Jews, living peacefully side by side. Oh yes, that's what they've heard before. That was how apartheid in South Africa was sold to the world. Homelands for the blacks and the rest of the countries for the whites, living peacefully side by side. That's, that's what apartheid was in South Africa in those days. And that is what apartheid is in Israel, Palestine, in to, uh, today. I know people say, oh no, a two-state solution is the best and only solution that is actually possible. But it is my strong opinion that we have to take a very principled stand in this. Because in the end, there can only be one ultimate goal, a democratic, secular state where both peoples can live together with the same rights and total equality. Because the, right, the righteousness of it is unquestionable. Well, maybe that's the most important lesson we can learn from the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. One state, one people. And for that to be achieved, we can also learn from the methods that were developed in the 70s and in the 80s. Building up maximum pressure everywhere in the world, but especially in the, U in the US and in the Western world. Mass mobilization in the streets and above all, effective use of international boycott and sanctions campaign. In conclusion, I can tell you from my own experience, this struggle can actually be won. A broad worldwide movement together with the people of Palestine and progressive Israel can win and will win. And I don't have to tell you that that is absolutely worth fighting for. Thank you. everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be joining this panel also with all the amazing speakers and contributions that I've already heard. Uh, I was asked to reflect a bit on uh, the state of the Palestine Solidarity Movement in the Netherlands because uh, yeah, after months of running around I think it's also good to reflect on what we're doing and to think uh, about the next steps. Um, so I think for the last months uh, we've seen like an incredible uprise of uh, our solidarity movement. We've seen 
many different kinds of tactics being used. We've seen mass mobilizations. The first demonstration in October that was organized was the biggest Palestine uh, solidarity protest in a decade. We've done months of sit-ins at train stations. Uh, right now we're seeing the uprising of the student intifada. Um, so yeah, it's, it's incredibly uh, moving to see that we're all taking to the streets. Um, and a lot of new local groups have popped up. I've heard uh, that, for example, Dutch Scholars for Palestine has really also greatly increased in members. We've seen the Erevrav anti-Zionist Jewish group uh, coming up and all different kinds of local um, yeah, groups. Um, and I also think that things are moving a bit, even if um, it's maybe not in the pace that we'd like it to see. But for example, in the struggle for the academic boycott right now, there are different like smaller uh, educational institutes that have announced to cut the ties uh, with Israel, like the uh, Design Academy in Eindhoven, the Dutch Academy for the Royal Arts in The Hague. Um, um, and also, yeah, I, I think this is also going to have an effect on the bigger ones. Um, and yesterday I've read also that, for example, the COC, the main uh, lobby organization for the LGBTQ community, uh, has decided to cut all their ties with Booking.com. And this is also, I think, really uh, a success and uh, could all only happen from with pressure from below and the uh, campaign that there is right now against Booking.com. Uh, who is complicit in um, yeah, offering vacation homes on stolen land. Um, but I think it's also good to reflect on the period that's coming because we are in uh, the middle of the formation of a far-right cabinet and the landscape is going to change. So I think the, um, the new cabinet that is led by the PVV is going to be a disaster for everyone in the working class, um, the climate, and everyone that's fighting for freedom and equality. Um, because they will gear up our right to protest also even more. And I think the Palestine Solidarity Movement is kind of on the front lines of this. Uh, and last week we've also heard that they appointed uh, Dick Schoof as the new minister for the new cabinet for builders and Dick Schoof um, was the former chair of the National Coordinator of Counterterrorism and Security. So he has kind of, um, and he was also very active in the IVD. So he has made a career out of spying on activists and bypassing the law uh, in different ways to suppress activists and marginalized peoples. So we will have a new prime minister who will not uh, hesitate to turn the Netherlands into a police state even more. Um, and also different leaders from the PVV, BBB, and PVD have hinted that they wanted to further crack on the rights of protest for a very long time. Um, and I think we've already seen this uh, before. Before, So for example, after the demonstration against Yitzhak Herzog, um, the media kind of took it upon themselves to smear the protest uh, as an anti-Semitic um, hate fest, uh, whilst it was actually the demonstration was organized by the organization that I mentioned previously, Erevrav, the anti-Zionist Jewish collective. But of course, they uh, never invite them to talk shows, etc. Um, but yet, after this, the whole Tweede Kamer fantasized about that maybe it's better for the future that we, uh, when de demonstrations, uh, when you uh, unmelt it, like when you announce it, then the state should decide if it's problematic or not. And this is also the same state that, uh, from left to right, is saying that the slogan from the river to the sea is hate speech. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to, to get, get ready for that. And also, I think even if this policy right now is not yet in place, the cabinet is not there, we can already see that the police is getting more emboldened to use excessive violence and repression. I think we've seen this really clearly in the student movement. Uh, there have been numerous of incidents of uh, police officers um, inflicting violence deliberately, hitting people on heads, etc. Um, yeah, thank you. So 
I think we can see like also the double standards because of the politicians that have been talking about like hate speech, we need to uh, protect their, um, uh, the right to protest, uh, freedom of speech and cancel culture kind of let this happen as well. Um, and I think one of the points that uh, we as international socialists has always uh, have, have focused on uh, um, and always um, um, underscored is that we need to um, um, put pressure also on the established left to connect to the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Um, and it's more crucial than ever that we organize um, our protest in the broadest way as possible because if we are divided and small, we are much more easy to be uh, attacked. Um, so, yeah, we need to involve people who are in solidarity with the with the cause, or maybe not just uh, maybe not inside the movement right now. Um, and we see that we can also be um, effective in this, and we can see that we can put pressure on uh, different institutions. Like for example, this was done uh, at the first of May demonstration. Um, the, there's a new group. Union Workers for Palestine, who organized the Palestine block in the 1st of May demonstration. And uh, because of this, uh, the 1st of May was the biggest, I think, also in 10 years. Um, it was very militant, it was really good. And uh, right after this, the um, union bureaucracy, uh, the, the chairman, Peter Elsenkhan, someone else, um, on the stage after the demonstration, in their speech, they specifically referred to Palestine and Gaza. And this would have never been done without the pressure from below. So I think, yeah, we need to see our struggles as interconnected and um, really see like building a stronger union and a stronger uh, workers' movement is directly also related to Palestine. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think I'm going to end over there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I think we need to see this. Um, we need to see our role, I think, um, in the Netherlands as in building like long term campaigns that can put pressure on the state of Israel to put pressure on all institutions or government and companies to sanction, divest and boycott Israel also on the long term also um, when perhaps there is a ceasefire, we still have a lot to fight for. And I think we should see it as a broader struggle also against imperialism and that building a Palestine solidarity movement is very crucial, but we also need to build a strong working class that can struggle and that can win. And in order for, for us to win, we need to see these struggles as interconnected, for example, also related to the struggle against racism in the Netherlands, um, because Wilders is on the one hand a danger for Palestinians uh, he supports the genocide in Gaza, but he also wants um, <coughs> Moroccan Dutch people to be ethnically cleansed. So I think, yeah, we need to stress that we want all our movements uh, to win and to be successful. Uh, the fight against racism in the Netherlands, the fight against the academic boycott, because it's not just about the academic boycott, it's also about ownership of uh, our universities and deciding uh, how our money should be spent and how our universities should be run. Uh, the fight for against the climate crisis is interconnected with Palestine, but if we don't fight for a livable climate, it's going to end us all. Um, even if leaders of unions, NGOs, etc. don't agree with us at first, I think we need to uh, claim our space in the movement and to make them move um, as well. Because at the end of the day, I see the Palestine Solidarity Movement really as class struggle and only the working class has the yeah the power to make the system fall basically. <laughs>